abolish the death penalty against the overwhelming desire of the people of those countries, right? So um, part of what you're seeing in these factors are these are all things that allow a government and political actors, political elites to operate without paying too heavy a price with the voters, right? So if you're in a multi-party system, it's not just Democrats versus Republicans, there's like five or six parties on the ballot. It's a lot harder to punish one party uh, for being soft on crime, et cetera. If you've got a culture that puts a lot of emphasis on experts as setting the direction for criminal law policy, again, politicians can kind of go, well, the professors told us to do it, don't blame us, right? So um, all of those reflect ways of establishing abolition without essentially popular support. And the other thing to notice is the United States is virtually the anti-image of all of these things. Uh, a relatively centralized state and uniform nationwide penal code, well, we have 52 different penal codes. Uh, public intellectuals who can shape national debate, well, we've got Colbert and Bill O'Reilly. I don't quite know if that's going to shape national debate on, uh, in the way that he has in mind here. Strong expert inf influence on criminal law legislation policy. Again, three strikes and you're out. Um, advertising folks and political activists shape crime policy, not experts in this country. Proportional or multi-party parliamentary system, clearly... Our party system has gotten even more polarized than it used to be, is by no means a multi-party parliamentary system. And not only do we not have a bureaucratic professionalization of the jury, uh, we have death-qualified juries that allow only people who support the death penalty to end up on juries. So in all of these ways, um, the United States might look like uh, not a case, a very difficult case for abolition. And not because of some intrinsic cultural difference from Europe, or the fact that we didn't experience the Holocaust as a moral event, but because our political system provides absolutely no cover for any political figure who wants to move toward abolition, and we require our politicians from Godcatcher on up to take a stand on the death penalty by and large. Now, something remarkable happens in Europe in the 80s, and it spreads quickly beyond Europe, and that is, Having abolished the death penalty through these individual national moves, Europe in the 80s begins to very quickly consolidate around a theme that opposition to the death penalty is, no longer, is not only a requirement for being part of Europe, essentially it's a requirement that you oppose the death penalty as a political project in other countries around the world as part of your commitment to the European Convention on Human Rights. And that's what comes along with Protocol Number 6 in 1983. You can see this language from the, um, the introductory or prefiguratory uh, passage in that directly references the trend that we've seen, considering that the evolution... Um, considering that the evolution that has occurred in several member states of the Council of Europe expresses a general tendency in favor of abolition of the death penalty, these two articles, therefore, are adopted. Abolition of the death penalty. The death penalty should be abolished. No one should be condemned to such a penalty or executed. It does leave the exemption for uh, the death penalty in time of war, and that is eliminated by Protocol Number 13 in 1998. You also get a new optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a part of the Universal, is the UN system, comes after the Universal Declaration. This was adopted in 1989, and it provides for the total abolition of the death penalty, although it does allow state parties to retain the death penalty in time of war if they make a reservation to the effect. The United States has not signed uh, this protocol, but many, many countries around the world have. And also, our, we've been talking about Europe, but the other fascinating thing, I'd love some people to write papers on the death penalty in South America. South America, Latin America is almost as death penalty free a zone as Europe. The great holdout is Cuba under the Castro's, which uh, remains uh, quite committed to the death penalty, apparently. But uh, elsewhere in Latin America, the death penalty has uh, essentially uh, disappeared. Um, you've also got major decisions by human rights courts that even beyond not allowing their own countries to administer the death penalty, they will also not allow their own countries to cooperate with countries that do use the death penalty. So in Surrey versus the United Kingdom, Surrey uh, had killed an American and then fled back to the UK. And he was, uh, the British government sought to uh, extradite him, him to, uh, I don't recall which state he was facing uh, murder charges in, but basically this, the European Court of Human Rights held that it would be a violation of, the universe, of their Convention on Human Rights to even send him back to a country where he might get the death penalty. And the other area where there's been a real, um, even uh, more rapid and perhaps more universal spread is the ban on the juvenile death penalty, which virtually every country other than a real handful, that include Iran, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, and until fairly recently the United States, but thanks to Roper versus Simmons that we'll look at next week, we also now ban the death penalty uh, anyone under uh, 18. Well, let me um, sort of uh, bring this to a close by suggesting, and here I'll quote from David Garland's important uh, new book on the death penalty, Peculiar Institution, America's Death Penalty in an Age of Abolition. He writes, international legal norms have internationalized death penalty politics. The new reform movement has succeeded in elevating death penalty abolition to the status of an international human rights principle. And I think that's a very important point, because obviously, once something is defined as a human rights principle, it doesn't necessarily achieve instant or universal acceptance. But what we see over time is that, by and large, when something gets defined as a human rights standard, whether it's the abolition of slavery, whether it's basic rights for women, or whether it's the abolition of the death penalty now, it's a kind of ratchet. It means that the world is not going to go backwards on that, and that time will only show more countries getting on the side of that norm. And what tends to happen is, because it's an international human rights norm, it begins to create a new circuit of conflict and power around the death penalty. So if you're in the United States, or more relevantly, if you're China, or South Korea, or Taiwan, and you want to do business with the European Union, and you want to have your standing in the world uh, uh, recognized by the countries, you have a problem around the death penalty. It doesn't mean that you have to get rid of it, right? Nobody's telling China, you know, we won't accept any more containerships until you stop executing people. But China sees it on the horizon as an issue that they have to do with. So they're reducing the death penalty. They're moving to lethal injection. They're bringing more criminal procedure reforms, right? The United States has eliminated the death penalty for juveniles, for the retarded. And all of this, I think, is connected in some ways to this internationalization and the reframing of the death penalty as essentially a human rights issue rather than a kind of cr criminology or crime policy uh, issue. I want to just end with this map, um, which may be a little out of date now. Um, and um, it's because it's scaled to country size, et cetera, and not population. It doesn't obviously give a fair representation of the world's population in terms of the death penalty, because a lot of them are in China, very obviously, and India, by the way, um, both of which retain the death penalty. A couple of brief observations. As you see, Latin America is essentially a death penalty-free zone, whether in practice or in full abolition. Europe, if you, especially when you throw in that, that big green zone, is Russia, which is uh, essentially not, it hasn't fully eliminated the death penalty, but it hasn't handed down any death sentences. It essentially has a moratorium. What you basically see is that the death penalty is becoming concentrated in the United States. And then, essentially, a band of countries running through the, essentially, between the Islamic side of Africa through the Near East into Asia. As we'll see, though, Asia is a very complicated picture. Just as to close, consider two countries, China and India, two of the, you know, the two most populated countries in the world, two of the up-and-coming economic and political powers in the world, couldn't be more different than when it comes to the death penalty. China continues to rely on the death penalty heavily, uses it for many, many crimes. India 
hardly uses the death penalty at all. If they execute one or two people a year, it's unusual. They recently sentenced to death the surviving Mumbai bomber. That's the kind of person who will get a death sentence in India. It's not even clear that they'll carry it out against him. So be careful of any facile assumptions that Asia is somehow, first of all, one thing, what one cultural space, which very clearly it cannot be. It's an artifact of European colonial imagination that we even think of it as one uh, continent. But more importantly, even in East Asia, which might be thought of as kind of the last readout of strong cultural support for the death penalty outside of the Islamic world, as we'll see next week when we look at Johnson and Zimmering, there's real signs of change. South Korea came close to a moratorium for a period of time. Taiwan has come very close to it. And as I said, China itself has begun to show signs of change. In any event, have a great weekend. Uh, look for all the slides up on the website now and the memo uh, about the paper next week.